What's up, everybody? So yesterday, I wrote a blog post, and this blog post was called Pentest Tales, You Spent How Much on Security? Now, this post was a part of a talk that I had given in the past, but I think I'm making this into a web series or blog, and a lot of you were saying, can you please put it in a video format? I don't like to read um, millennials, right? But I'm in the I'm in the same boat. So uh, I kind of want to tell you a little bit about some pen test stories that uh, I've had in the past and kind of walk you through real world examples. And uh, just as clarification, my neighbor is mowing. So if you hear mowing going on in the background, totally what's going on. Uh, but anyway, so today's story, and this is the first of hopefully many that we bring to the channel, is about a large hospital that we did a pen test on. And I'm going to bring up a PowerPoint, but I'm only going to bring up a little bit at a time. So uh, in terms of this, so in terms of this hospital, so we had a large hospital and they had some protection measures or defenses in place. OK, they had been spending a lot of money on security. They had intrusion detection, intrusion prevention. Uh, they had CyberArk, which is a privilege access management. And we'll talk about that here in a second. Uh, they also had uh, antivirus. They actually had endpoint protection. Um, I think it was Symantec on all devices. And IPv6 was disabled. But this client still went down within a couple hours. So let's kind of talk through these. And um, so the first things first, when we talk about somebody or a client that has um, these kind of protection measures in place, we have to immediately or almost immediately change our methodology when we're thinking about this. Um, so the one of the common attacks when we're in a network or an internal network is we're starting to think, hey, maybe I can use something like LMNR poisoning, right? And LMNR poisoning, if you're not tracking, will send a hash, a NTLMB2 hash, uh, over to the man in the middle. So we can sit man in the middle position as an attacker. We can intercept domain hashes or domain user hashes. And we can take those and try to crack those offline. Now, I've got videos on everything I'm going to be talking about today. So I'll go ahead and show you the first video. Um, here is the first one. And I'll put links down below. But if you want to look at this, Active Directory Exploitation, LMNR, MBTNS Poisoning. Also, just as a pro tip, if you go to the Academy, and you go to the PEH course here, all of these steps and more are covered in the Practical Ethical Hacking course. And right now, through the end of the month, you can get 50% off with the code half off TCM. So I'll put that down in the description below, a little bit of marketing thrown in. But anyway, so when we talk about LMNR and MBTNS, we talk about intercepting those hashes and taking them offline and cracking them. Well, why is that not uh, applicable here? Well, it's not applicable because we're up against CyberArk. Now, if you don't know what CyberArk is, CyberArk is a privilege access management tool. Its main purpose is to prevent uh, attacks like this. So with CyberArk, you, you have a lot of features, and we can talk about some of the features. But one of the features, for example, is this kind of check-in, check-out policy where, say, I'm a domain user and I want to check out my account. I can go check it out. I will get a credential for maybe eight hours, 12 hours. And then that credential will automatically check itself back in, or I can go check it back in when I'm done with it. The other side of that is you can do that with domain admin accounts as well. So these credentials are minimum usually of 15 characters long. For domain admins, we typically set them for 30 characters or even longer. Um, and it just makes it near impossible for an attacker to capture a password and utilize it, right? So if we were to capture a hash, we can't crack it. If for some reason we were to capture a password, somehow we got a password and it's that 15 or 30 character password, that expires within a few hours, right? So we're up against the clock and there's not really a lot of persistence there. CyberArk Cyber Arc is kind of difficult to get around sometimes. Um, but that will also lead to sort of a downfall, the misconfiguration, which we'll talk about too. Uh, so it can be set, I'm going to preface this, CyberArk can be set on local accounts and on domain accounts. Here in this instance, it was only set on domain accounts, foreshadowing. Now, the next thing that we need to talk about is if they have intrusion detection in place, 
Um, vulnerability scanning is not going to do much for us. Another thing to point out about this company is uh, that they had really good patch management. They they were up to date for a, for a hospital. I mean, that's amazing, especially if you're thinking about all the things that are going on with the hospitals in the last even couple of months. Um, we have the malware that we're talking about right now uh, that's possibly sitting in a ransomware, possibly sitting in hospitals ready to deploy. Um, somebody died due to ransomware within the last month or so, and that was the first known death, I believe. Uh, UHS in the United States was compromised by ransomware. I believe it was UHS. And so we're having all these attacks on hospitals, uh, this, this medical format, uh, very vulnerable from having pen tested a lot of hospitals in the past, very, very vulnerable, um, usually out of date equipment, lots of, you know, just gaps in their security. So to see a, a hospital that has these kind of security measures in place, that was awesome to see. So patching, patching was there. So even if we were able to vulnerability scan, which we really weren't, patching was there. So we really couldn't attack it from that aspect. Uh, so we have to think about, OK, well, if we can't do vulnerability scanning and we really can't do some of the common attacks. Oh, another common attack. IPv6, man in the middle six was disabled. And if you want to see an attack on Man in the Middle 6, I have a video here. Of course, I have it in the course, but here's another video. Domain admin via IPv6 takeover. This is an insanely easy to pull off and almost all, almost always exists in networks. So they were thinking about this as well. Uh, great video. Again, I'll link it down in the description. And I mean, Man in the Middle 6, super easy, but again, blocked here. So... If we're facing uh, where we can't vulnerability scan, we can't LMNR, we can't man the middle six, um, some of our common easy attacks are gone. So the thought process then becomes, well, what can I do? What, what are some things that we can do within the internal network to maybe uh, get around this? And uh, one of the things that I would do in that situation is I would start looking at services. Uh, I start with web servers usually, so I'll just put a little probe out and see if I can find any web servers that are alive in the network. And then I will go start looking at those web servers and seeing if there's anything um, that could potentially be there. And we'll have another video or tale in this series where a network was incredibly locked down and still went down because of one mistake on a web server. Um, and that's one of my favorite stories to tell. Just one mistake brought the entire network down. Uh, but anyway, so there could be information leakage. There could be passwords. There could be default credentials. There could be all sorts of things. Um, if we find something like a Jenkins server where you know that there, if you log in or potentially even um, not logged in, there could be the potential for a remote shell. All we need is to somehow establish a foothold to potentially move around the network. It's not always a guarantee, but there's a good chance that we can start moving around the network once we get a foothold, uh, at least laterally, if not vertically. So what we want to do is somehow get that foothold because then we can start getting a lot more information about our network. Um, with that being said, the foothold is usually the hardest thing to get. Once you get it, things start to fall, dominoes start to fall, um, things start to fall in place. Not always, um, but a lot of the time. So with that, I start thinking, okay, well, what are some other attacks that we can do? Because LLMNR was actually enabled in the network, it just wasn't something that I could crack the password. But what if we don't want to crack the password? What if we instead relay the password? Now, I'm going to talk about this, and I'm going to show you two different things. Uh, of course, there is a video. So if you're interested in popping a shell uh, with Empire, here's a video on it. Um, and also for the PowerPoint presentation, I love PowerPoint. I don't love PowerPoint. OK, so let's briefly talk about SMB Relay. SMB Relay is basically getting the LLMNR man in the middle and capturing that response. But instead of taking that hash and cracking it, we just relay it. OK. Two requirements, SMB signing, I know it says SMB, SMB signing must be disabled on the target and the relay user credentials must be admin on the machine. That is a false statement, but it's mostly true. And I'll explain both of these. So let's take this in a scenario where we have a user named Bob and Bob has a workstation and he has a file share. So SMB is open and Bob is an admin on that machine. Um, and well, he doesn't have to be an admin on that machine, actually. Bob, Bob's just using that machine. Um, Bob is an admin on another machine, though, and uh, that machine also has file share SMB open. And we capture Bob's credentials via via responder, via LMNR poisoning. We we get it coming in, okay? 
um, instead of capturing the credentials, we relay those credentials. Now, SMB signing is something that is by default enabled on all Windows servers, but disabled on all Windows workstations. So the chances of us getting a Windows server with this attack is pretty slim unless somebody went and manually configured it turned off, which I don't know why they would do. Um, the other option would be to relay it to a workstation and just get a shell and see where we can go from there. And that's exactly what happened. So what SMB signing does is it says, prove to me that you are who you say you are. Without that, all we're doing is relaying the credentials. SMB is like, yeah, that's Bob. All right, I, I believe you and we're in. So we're going to take those credentials and relay them and get on the machine. Now, when I say that you must be an admin, it's not entirely true. You can relay credentials that are not administrator. However, you get so much more with an administrator. You can get a shell and machine, you can dump hashes, you can get all kinds of stuff. Um, the You can gather some information with a low level user, but it's, it's all right. I would rather have an admin all day. So I'm gonna go ahead and skip to the next slide, which is cool because this is an actual image from the relay. So I've obfuscated what I need to. And I just want to point out some things. So you can see that we've got the, the relay. I went ahead and just dumped the SAM file here. And I come through here and we could see some patterns. We see a few accounts. We see this administrator account. We also see tech support, tech support too, and this admin, which I've obfuscated a little bit just because it had some other name in there. So if you come into here and you look at the hashes, and I don't know why I blurred these out because I'm going to give you the password in a second. But if you look at these hashes, uh, you could see 15379 at the end, 15379, 15379, all the same password, right? Same hash, same password. Uh, user 2, user 3 as well, same password. I am more interested in anything that says tech support or says admin because those would be accounts that potentially could be on everything. You got to think about the lazy admin in this situation. What does lazy admin do? Lazy admin will create an account and we'll utilize that account over and over and over and over in the network, right? Why, why make things hard? You make one piece of documentation, you say, hey, the password help desk department or tech support department is this, and this is what logs into every computer. I've worked in help desk before. That is exactly the shit that we did, okay? That is exactly what we did. We used the same password everywhere for all clients. It was a relatively strong password. I will give them that, stronger than what I'm about to reveal. However, it was still reused everywhere. If somebody were to take over the domain account and where I used to work and push that to all the other clients, they would own every single client. And I would guarantee you that we were not the only help desk type role out there doing that. I guarantee you there's a lot. So if you're watching this and you're in help desk and you're reusing passwords everywhere, please stop it. If you're an IT administrator and you're watching this and you're reusing passwords everywhere, please stop it. Okay. Uh, so we take this and I we have a couple options now. What we can do is we can pass the hash. We never need to crack this hash. Uh, cracking the hash does have some benefits, which we'll talk about in a second. If we get the password, we could potentially use the password elsewhere. But what we can also do is just pass the hash around. I decided to crack it and pass, uh, pass the password because I just want to see how difficult it was to crack this password. I ran it through, I think it was RockU, just for a quick pass, just to see if I could crack it, and I cracked it. And what did it come out to? Well, it came out to power 10. And I'm willing to reveal this password to you because this password has been changed. The client is has fixed this issue. Um, so I don't think there's any revealing anything that would be sensitive data here anymore. Now, if you look at this, we're using a tool called Crack Map Exec. This tool will pass a password around the environment looking at SMB in this instance. And what we're doing is you can see every instance that says pwned here is an instance where we have the credentials that worked on that machine, and that would give us admin access to that machine. Look at all these, okay? Um, and this is just what I could fit into a screenshot in this environment, pretty much, and this is one subnet. Look at this is one subnet. This is not an entire environment. This is a hospital, it's huge. Uh, it worked everywhere, okay? Now, it did not, it did not work um, on the domain controller. So I will, I will give them credit with that. It did not work on the domain controller, all right? But when you have access to this many machines, uh, it becomes trivial to get access to the domain controller because um, we can start looking for token impersonation. We can start looking at um, possibly leaked credentials somewhere. But one of the things that I like to do is just dump all the hashes, continuously dump all the hashes, collect all that data, find the unique hashes, and look around the network. Now, that's exactly what I did. 
However, we're up against one issue. Um, I was able to, if you tried to run PS exec, you would get blocked by Symantec, okay? Um, if you try to run traditional PS exec. Now, WMI exec and SMB exec have the possibility of working without getting picked up by detection. I've had great success there before. Uh, but we were able to issue remote commands to the machine to disable the antivirus that was running. And we need a password to disable the antivirus. Can you guess what the password was? It was power 10. So this is why cracking it can be useful because then you have the password and it's just reused all over the environment. Um, especially a weak password like this. This is just, I mean, it's, it's bad news bears, but it, it, it does happen. And this is very real world. So I kind of want to share that. Um, so anyway, go around, dump hashes, find them. Again, we don't have to crack the hash. And here's proof of that. We don't have to crack the hash. We just have to pass the hash if we want or utilize the hash. Uh, this is an example of utilizing the hash, logging in here. And you can see that we are authority system on the domain controller. We never compromised a domain account in this entirety of this, uh, this pen test. The domain accounts were secure. CyberArk was secure. However, local user accounts can still get you access to machines and still own a network. Now, we did crack this password. This password came out to be welcome one, and we owned the domain. Um, didn't matter. We owned it anyway. So what are some lessons learned? There's a few things. SMB signing. Now, this wouldn't prevented everything, perhaps, but SMB signing being enabled on the network would have uh, possibly, well, it would have stopped the relay attack, OK? With the relay attack being stopped, we would have had to attempt other avenues. Maybe we didn't find anything. Maybe that stopped us in our tracks. We don't know, but the more footholds you can eliminate for an attacker, the harder it will become. Now, if an attacker has motivation, they're sitting within your network, that's obviously dependent. But if it's somebody that is just got into your network looking around, maybe a lazy, lazy hacker, um, you know, you're stopping, you're stopping an attack right here. Least privilege is huge. If these administrator accounts aren't a thing on these machines, if Bob doesn't have administrative account or access on multiple machines or even his own machine, uh, this is this would prevent this attack as well. So, um, and with all the other all the other password or passing the passwords, these administrator accounts, those tech support accounts, I understand it, I get it. However, the passwords should be unique per every computer, and they should be complex. Um, it should be hard. If I'm dumping one. If I'm dumping a hash out, I shouldn't be able to use that hash everywhere. Account tiering is special, especially important um, or very important. Uh, anyway, account tiering. So say Bob is a domain admin. If Bob is using just one account for both domain admin activities and regular user activities, that is wrong. Bob should have split accounts. Bob should only log into the domain controller with his domain admin account and not log in with the domain account admin account anywhere else. I'm tripping over my words. But anyway, so Bob should use his regular account for his regular self and his domain admin account for his domain admin duties. Uh, a lot of times we do not see that. And if we were to relay a domain admin account or we were able to compromise a domain admin account, that would be very, very dangerous. OK, so account tiering is super important. And oh, yeah, don't reuse your passwords like that's that's the big thing here, right? Like reusing the passwords. If the passwords were different across all the machines, we probably don't get anywhere. Um, even if we get access to one machine, yes, we have a foothold now, but it's not the end of the world. We could still be stopped in our tracks. You make it too easy when you use the same password locally everywhere. So this is a great example of millions of dollars in security. Um, when I was on the domain controller, they had all kinds of great group policies to prevent all sorts of attacks. I mean, they were very security conscious. They were spending money. They had a great security team and they still went down. And it's just the simple, simple negligence like this can take an entire network down. And especially something as critical as a hospital is it's very, very scary. So. Hopefully that is a lesson learned for you. If you like this video, please do hit the like button, hit subscribe, comment down below. Um, hopefully you like the blog. I'll link it down to below if you want to read it instead of watching the video. But um, either way, I hope you enjoy this. And until next time, my name is The Cyber Mentor, and I do thank you for joining me. Peace out.